Sarah is going to talk to us about supporting lab learning. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, yes, I'd like to first start by thanking um, the organisers for the invitation to come and talk to you today. This is a topic that I've done quite a lot of work on in the last uh, few years, even pre-pandemic. Um, and it's something that actually I'm quite passionate about. Um, so I'm not going to talk directly about labs themselves, but about how we can support lab learning, kind of um, uh, support the learning around the labs themselves. So to give you a bit of context for where I'm coming from, so within our university in 2012, we opened a new lab, which we call Super Lab, um, which is technology rich. So students in that lab aren't, don't have access to paper. We don't use whiteboards and things like that. It's a paperless environment um, because it's a category two containment facility. So they do all of their work using electronic devices. And because we have a capacity of up to 190 94 students. We also employ technology to support them in terms of being able to hear the academics that are talking to them. Um, and obviously, we have a lot of different technology and equipment that we use with the students, which tries to bring that sort of work-like environment um, into their studies. So on the background, sort of in the backdrop of that, we wanted to try and understand more about their sort of learning in the lab. So that was why I came into the university um, to do a pedagogic project around that. Um, but as part of that, we wanted to look at how we support students before they even go into the lab and the importance of that. So. I want to kind of do a bit of a delve into some psychology around um, the learning theories and talk to you a bit about the work that we've done both within our organization and as a survey of what's going on across the sector, which um, we did pre-pandemic. So um, I think one of the things that I want to start with is just acknowledging that labs can be a really challenging learning environments for students. and. The reason why we talk about it in that way is around the learning, the theories of cognitive overload. So this is where we're going to start going into kind of psychology a little bit. Um, and it's about how we form memories and make those connections to store information. Um, so when we think about long term memory storage or formation, it's about the fact that we go through a process which uses what's known as the working memory. So when we encounter information, it kind of goes into our working memory and that's where we process, organize it and then kind of prepare it to be made into long long term memories. Um, and there are three parts to the um, working memory. So we think about the central executive, which is kind of an area where we deal with problem solving um, and how we redirect information to the right place. So when it comes kind of uh, the stimulus comes to earth, how to prioritize where we should be dealing with it. Um, so we also have the visual spatial sketch pad, which is if you have visual information. So if somebody was reading something, um, it would go into that area of the working memory to deal with. And similarly, we have the phonological loop, which is for dealing with kind of um, oh, actually written information goes into there, but spoken language goes into there, too. So it's quite a complex uh, concept the working memory but one of the things that is an issue is that you can only deal with a really small number of things at a time so the average adult is um, supposed to have somewhere between five and seven things that it can process they can process at any one time so I've got my little graphic there if you imagine there's a person they've got you know five to seven things that they're trying to deal with at one point and they're able to balance those they're kind of coming into um, you know they're they're kind of being able to juggle those things and kind of still perform their task walking along juggling these these ideas um, but if we start to exceed this then our working memory starts to become kind of clogged and overloaded and we end up in a situation where we can no longer juggle the things that what we're trying to juggle and you can think of it uh, in terms of an analogy like um, a computer so if your hard drive is where you store your information but your ram is actually what controls how quickly your information is going to be able to be processed and if you try and have too many tabs open at the same time 
everything gets frozen up and you don't actually have an ability then to kind of move forward and your learning can be impaired as a result. Um, and it can get to the point at which people aren't able to prioritize any kind of information. So perhaps if we think of it in the lab as, you know, the student who's wandering around, doesn't know what to do, doesn't really know what they're looking to, you know, they started off looking for something, maybe a piece of equipment, but completely just don't kind of have a sense of what they need to be doing to achieve that kind of lab um, practical. So there is something that we can do about this and to try and avoid that overload, that cognitive overload, we can make use of a part of our kind of um, working memory, the perception filter, which kind of acts like a barrier. It's like a sieve. It sort of sifts out information. So if we imagine, um, so I've got the schematic on the screen. So if we imagine these are things that the students might encounter in a lab, it might be that they're working with a new piece of equipment. It might be that they're having to record observations that they're making. It might be that they're trying to make sense of the protocol that they're working with. Um, and the perception filter is there and takes from the long term memory storage um, and will look at for information and go, oh, I remember that. So this is important and it's like a filter. So it enables people to kind of go, right, this information is important. So I need to focus on this. So by familiarizing students with material before they go into the lab, we can help that perception filter to kind of filter out what's extraneous information and what they need to prioritize to enable them to make the best and to not have that cognitive overload so that they can process what's actually going on kind of around them and in their experiment or, or whatever it is that they're planning to do. And this is kind of a similar kind of idea whether or not the lab is a wet lab or a dry lab. It's about familiarizing people with um, the material ahead of time so that that perception filter can help them to continue to learn and to make sense of what's going on around them. So I've drawn some analogies from chemistry here. So work um, by Mike Seary, some of you may be familiar with him. He's done quite a lot of work chemistry around supporting students with three labs. Um, and he's broken those down into kind of three main areas and I think that's something that's quite important to think about because it actually tackles kind of different areas of learning so the lingual like more learning uh, takes in the cognitive aspect as well as the motor aspect and what we call the effective domain so things like confidence and motivation and we can prepare the students in any one or all of those by introducing concepts that they're working with. So helping them make that link between the um, theory that they're doing and the experiment that they're going to be doing. So you can do that via sort of seminars or lectures or having discussions with students. You could do that having quizzes that they do like online quizzes to prepare them. Um, you can use it for things like techniques and skills. So for me, particularly, particularly for our first year students, uh, I'm going to talk about a case study of some work that I did looking at videos to help students with techniques that they might find difficult, uh, but also kind of simulations that students might do of experiments or doing aspects of safety might also fall into this category. Um, and like I said, you know, that effective um, domain, that that confidence and motivation can have a big impact on preparing the students to go into the lab. So what we did um, a few years ago um, is we did a systematic review of biosciences pre-labs in HE. So chemistry have done things like this previously. So going back to 2003, they looked across HE institutions to see what people were doing to prepare students for labs. Um, and although there's a, a body of literature out there about independent kind of um, interventions that people have done and the impact that those have had, there hasn't been a systematic review across the entire of HE. Well, that was that was the plan, obviously. Um, we've only had 30 HE institutions in the UK respond, so we don't have um, full coverage, but we do have 88 modules. 
um, about half of those in bioscience and half of those in chemistry. So this particular study was for us to try and make a comparison between bioscience and chemistry at some level because um, one of my collaborators, Jen Evans, um, works in chemistry. So she was looking at chemistry and I wanted to look at what was going on in bioscience because we didn't really have a good sense of what was going on in bioscience sort of across, across the um, HE institutions in the UK. So that's kind of where we started. Um, and the first table that you see on the right hand side there is really just to kind of show you the distribution. So we had a good range of modules, some of them first year. So I put the NQF levels. So that's how I think about our um, university levels. So first year undergraduates for us in England would be level four. Um, but I've put the Scottish equivalents there because I appreciate that some people who um, are listening may come from Scottish universities so so their levels are different so just for clarity purposes so we have a good range of modules that we looked at across um, those two disciplines um, and we do see some differences in the way that bioscience modules and chemistry modules um, look at things so when we looked at lectures and seminars um, in the first instance um, about two thirds of modules, both bioscience and chemistry modules, actually do do pre-lab sessions with their students. Um, and the table on the right hand side shows you um, the percentage attendance. So we asked everyone in the survey to try and estimate how many, what percentage of their students would attend. Um, so the highest ranking 81 to 100% was similar for both bioscience and chemistry. Um, which was slightly unexpected in as much as um, chemistry tended to mandate their students that it was compulsory to attend. So we perhaps were not surprised that the majority of their students did actually attend those sessions, but there was a high attendance for the bioscience students too. Um, and this quite possibly is something about how these sessions were structured. So, um, for the bioscience students, they were a lot more likely to have these sessions on the day of the lab, so at some point prior to the lab itself. So the students were likely to already be available because they were, say, on campus for the labs, because this was back in the time when we were all on campus. Um, and so I think it's uh, perhaps reflecting that, the fact that these students are already on campus, they come to the sessions to prep themselves for the lab um, and then go on from there into the lab itself. Whereas with chemistry, they seem to have sessions which are not on the day that the lab is, but they make them compulsory. Um, and that may also reflect the fact that they have a number of modules expressed that they made uh, it compulsory for students to do certain activities before they could go into the lab. So they were probably scheduling their pre-lab sessions to give the students the scope to be able to complete those in the time that they had um, in between the session and the lab itself. Um, so how many activities or different activities do different modules use? So on the left hand side you can see that we have um, the number of pre-lab activities along the bottom scale. Um, and what we can see is that actually bioscience students are likely to have fewer different types of activities in a module um, than chemistry counterparts. So we had some modules in chemistry doing up to seven different types of activities with their students as part of one module. Whereas the most that we saw in biosciences were three different activities and by far the most common activity that students undertook was being asked to read the protocol. Uh, and that was kind of consistent across all of the different levels that being asked to read the protocol was um, a consistent feature. Um, but we see a mixed kind of picture again when we look at percentage completion. So most of the bioscience modules didn't make these activities compulsory. Um, they were kind of uh, voluntary. So the students were, it was suggested that they should do these activities, but they weren't um, kind of told they had to. Whereas for chemistry, like I said, some of these were compulsory elements, particularly around things like safety and so on. So we have 
kind of a glimpse there that there are some differences in the way that we in bioscience are or were working compared to how chemistry um, are doing their pre-labs where they're doing a wider range of activities with their students. Um, so we had a look, albeit a relatively small number because of the number of participants and the number of participants with modules at different levels, at the different activities that students were doing. And we could see that actually things that we might consider to be at a kind of lower level targeting some of those key skills like doing calculations, um, reading the protocol, those are actually things that um, are predominantly in the kind of um, what the level four students are asked to do. Whereas when we get to, and there are some activities that both um, level six, so these for the English system, this is our final year undergraduates um, compared to our first year. So there are some activities that they share. So reading the protocol, they may be given additional reading to do, or they may be asked to watch a video. but Contextualized activities or experimental design, these were very much only seen within our level six um, modules and not in our level four, which is perhaps something, and it's reflected on by Siri in the work that he's done, which kind of um, indicates that as you go through the, the different years of a, of a degree, you work from those kind of core key skills into working um, towards independent research and being able to kind of design your own experiments and sort of independent research um, projects. So that is in keeping with is with what I hoped we would see, but didn't know if we would see. So we do see some difference in how how students or um, the types of activities that students are given depending upon the level that they are in the university. Um, so we wanted to do some work with our students. So we did, I did, made a series of videos. So one of the things that we knew when we came into um, starting to use a new lab was that there were certain techniques that students find difficult. And I think that's probably universal. Um, and we'd asked academic staff and students what they thought they found difficult or what staff thought students found difficult. And there were certain skills that they particularly focused on. One of them is microscopy, um, using the spectrophotometer, things like dilutions and pipetting as well. They were all skills that were common amongst both the academic staff and student responses. Um, so we wanted to try and support our level four students, particularly as they come in to do this kind of work. Um, and so we went on to create some pre-lab resources in the lab that um, the students would be using. So all of our first year students in the first term do all of their labs in Superlab. So they don't have access to paper, but they can access any of our digital kind of resources. And we gave them the resources ahead of time. And over the time that I've been doing this project, we've built up the number of videos that we use with them. Um, and we try to evaluate how the students find those resources, both in terms of usefulness and the quality of the resources um, by doing sort of survey and focus group work. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that um, and about my experiences, what <laughs> I think also what to avoid um, kind of fits into here. So in the first year, the approach we took was to focus on microbiology techniques and we embedded those into the protocols in the appropriate places. Um, we reviewed those by, by survey and in the second year we developed some additional resources which we embedded into one of their year one term one modules and those were around the microscopy spectrophotometry and the dilutions, serial dilutions and making um, mixing up solutions. So I've put a QR code there, so if anyone wants to have a look at one of the videos we made, that's a video that we made on gram staining. Um, and we try to incorporate into there not only the what are you doing, but why are you doing it to try and help the students to kind of review um, the theory behind what they're doing. Um, so this is a snapshot of some of the survey questions that we did 
um, ask the students afterwards and the two rows of bars for each question um, are from the first and second year, year that we did the surveys with the students. So you can kind of compare what kind of responses that we were getting. So for us, in some of the important questions, um, if we start from the bottom there, using the videos to help me think more deeply about what I was doing in the lab. So this goes back to that cognitive overload. So students who are becoming overloaded will have difficulty in thinking deeply, in focusing on the work that they're going to be doing. Um, so that for us was kind of tied in with that. So we got a favorable response to that um, on the whole. The students were more confident in working independently. So for us, that was really important because um, certainly in our institution as uh, the last few years, well, pre-pandemic years, certainly, um, we were seeing increased student numbers. And certainly for us, um, we had techniques like microscopy, which um, for those of you who do microscopy, you'll know that anytime there's a query, it can take quite a lot of time to support a student through that, um, which means it's quite staff intensive um, to have those kind of um, labs. But they're really valuable to the students. And it's a core skill that all of our students are expected to pass an assessment to show that they have that skill. Um, so it's obviously key for us that they have that support. Um, we had some questions around whether or not it mattered if the uh, equipment was the same or not. Um, they didn't seem to mind if it differed slightly, but they seemed to also think that it benefited them if it used the same equipment. So we have a kind of a bit of equivocal sort of answer there. For us, we went into the super lab to make the video so it was in their environment and we thought that might help them. But that, um, although those questions are kind of, um, similar, they're not actually the same questions. So um, perhaps explains why we're seeing a positive um, skew to the answers of those questions. Um, so when we ask them some open questions about why accessing it ahead of time would be useful, um, they gave us uh, a range of different responses, but this quote from one of the students actually um, epitomized that, which is, it gives you the chance to learn how to successfully use techniques or equipment that you may or may not be familiar with. There's a real confidence to which you get into the actual lab. They already know what is expected of you and you're able to use your time more efficiently. And ultimately, that's what we would hope for the students to be able to do. And it, it harks back to that idea of cognitive load, the fact that they're familiar with it, that they're confident in going into the lab. So they will get more from doing the lab itself. That would kind of be what that, that sort of particular quote would give us hope that the students are getting from it. Um, we also, obviously, as it was a resource, they had access to it afterwards and we asked them whether or not they thought it was useful to have it afterwards. And one of the things that I perhaps hadn't really appreciated, but is um, kind of alluded to in that quote, is around reflection on their performance, helping them to consolidate what they'd learned when they were in the lab. Um, and so obviously they see benefit in having kind of access to these resources sort of all the way around the lab, not just before or during or after. So do the students use the videos though? The uptake for the actual responses to the survey that we did were relatively low. Um, and over the different cohorts that we've worked with, um, the videos that we've used are across the bottom there. And we can see that if we look at the number of views on YouTube, because these are unlisted YouTube videos that the students can access. And we, we felt that YouTube was important to use because it's a platform the students are confident with. Um, there is a low usage in the cohorts prior to the pandemic. So the green bars represent the pandemic data. And um, you can see they're a lot higher. And part of that is about how we've developed using them. Um, and based on the survey data that we had and the conversation that we had with students in the focus group, um, we could see that kind of there were some barriers for the students in terms of using them. And so as the study's gone, we've evolved how we use them to try and help the students to make more use of them and to be able to access them in a way that supports their learning, because there's clearly value in them. 
but if you don't get to use them, then obviously that doesn't really help us very much. Um, and some of these videos we were able to use to support assessment. So because they're sh showcasing different techniques, we've used them uh, in assessment. So particularly the microbiology ones um, were used for a level five assessment because the students weren't able to actually go in and do the assessment because we were in lockdown at the time. Um, and we've embedded the videos around particularly things like microscopy in a different way to support the students. And given the limited availability that the students have had to get in the lab, um, they've obviously made use of those resources to try and support their learning um, when they're not able to get into the lab. So, oh, I'm very nearly out of time. Um, Yes, the barriers that I talked about is about making them more available. So we'd scaffolded them in their module rooms and in protocols, but they still didn't seem to know where they were. Um, and actually there was an issue around anxiety that was expressed, um, the idea that, you know, if you were say, if you were in the lab and you were accessing a video and some, you know, other people around you were not, um, that made them uncomfortable. So thinking about how we make use of videos um, and how we scaffold things for students actually has some, we need to have some thought about how we, we do that because clearly the way in which we were doing it at the time was not kind of working for the students terribly well. Um, so finally, I just wanted to kind of move on and, and say a little bit about where we are kind of now. So obviously in the pandemic, the students had less lab time and we've integrated our resources in a different way. Um, like I said, we've used them to support assessment when the labs weren't possible. And we've also kind of worked on a system of bio skills at home. So it's not actually um, using the video, well, it is using the videos, but in a different way. So we've given them home lab equipment. So actually the cover of the journal you see there is, um, you know, one of our students using the kit at home. And um, so they had access to pipettes, um, some USB microscopes to be able to do some experiments and to help build their confidence with key skills. And we've used our videos to continue to integrate with those resources so that they can use those, but in a different way. Um, so that is where I am with what I've done. Hopefully that's useful. The people I want to thank, um, Jen Evans, like I said, she collaborated with me. Um, Karen Moss is my director of studies. Um, Mike Coffey, Sandra Kirk and Shiva Siva Subramaniam also on my supervisory team because I've been doing this as part of a um, second PhD. So references. So thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. That's amazing. I, I really like the, um, I always like the theory up front to what's actually going on because it gives a good context of everything. So I was, I was very, it's always nice to see that. Um, I've got a question, but I'll save it to, to the end. If anyone else wants, got a question, unmute and ask, or I've got one from Nigel at the start of his office. He got in early. Um, this is relating to the videos and he's asking, do you see any differences in engagement with resources between male and female students? Um, so the YouTube analytics are what we use to look at how many views that we have. So we're obviously not able to track anything in terms of that. Um, I think in terms of the surveys that we've done, um, we generally have observed, and it's a phenomenon that I've generally observed in surveys that I've done, not just this one, is that you tend to get more responses from female participants than you do from male participants. I don't know if that's um, unique to our institution or whether that's just um, you know, kind of universal, but um, so it's it's difficult for me to put kind of numbers on there because it the any kind of gender split isn't something that we've been kind of trying to evaluate at this point. Okay, that's that's cool. Um, I was particularly interested at the start. You talked about confidence and motivation and preparing them for those. Now, many of the examples that you gave were were sort of technical skills based and uh, knowledge based. So in terms of the confidence and motivation and pre preparation. For laboratory delivery, um, what have you tried or what do you know about? 
So, so I think the thing is that often the the kind of activities you would do to it increase their confidence and motivation are things that also do something else. Um, so, say for example, one of the things with the technical videos was that students felt more confident going into the lab. And when we were doing the focus group, um, what one of the participants um, was talking about was that um, just by reading the protocol, they found it really complicated, kind of the description. And I think this is something that when you see a written protocol, it can be quite complex, particularly if it's something that you're not familiar with already. Um, and sometimes you can't avoid that. I think there are still some lessons for us to learn around how we can simplify and support those protocols in a better way, because that in itself can reduce the cognitive load. Um, but they felt more confident going in because they saw what they were going to be doing. They could refer it back to the protocol they were doing. So they felt more confident because it kind of reduced their anxiety because they went, this is really complicated. I don't really know what I'm doing with this. I don't understand it. And then they watched the video and they went, oh, actually, it's not as bad as I thought. So now I get it and now I'm okay with it. So that in itself improves their confidence. So at some level, um, that preparation of them for the kind of skills or what you expect them to do can do that. Um, but I think there's also things that you can do, like, for example, when we were looking at the HE survey, um, the level six contextualization activities. So those were things like how students apply um, the diagnostic tests or biochemical tests that they might do to be able to affect a diagnosis for a clinical case, for example. Those kind of activities that enable students to see how what they're doing fits into the real world context can be big motivators. Yeah. And, you know, so I think that those kind of activities can have that place as well. As So I think a lot of activities will kind of, if you like, multitask. They'll be both, you know, either de dealing with content, understanding and kind of some motivational confidence or kind of building their familiarity with the skills and therefore their confidence to go into the lab and do it. So um, I think although we kind of break them down into those three areas, I think really they're interrelated. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's inherent in the, in the act of doing it is and yeah. built into all that. Brilliant, Sarah. Uh, just one final comment before we talk to Manuel and just give anyone else the opportunity to ask a question. Um, you said the students didn't know where to go to the videos whilst we're in the lab. I've heard and we've tried heard in some institutions we've trialed in hours putting QR codes next to the relevant piece of equipment so that when they're standing in front of it, they can directly go, all oh, right, and bring it up. Have you considered using that? Have you tried using that kind of tech? Yes, yeah, so that was originally part of the design that we were going to move towards doing that. Um, in the end, within the scope of the kind of project that I was working on, we didn't manage to achieve that. Um, but it is a complex situation for us because we do have a large lab. It can have multiple labs running at the same time in different from different modules. So trying to put QR codes up against that, it's it's technically challenging. Um, so yes, we would have liked to have done it. We didn't um, achieve it within the time frame, but it's certainly something that we could look to go back and do again. Um, yeah, Excellent. and we did we did get good kind of responses. I didn't show that particular question, but we did get good responses to kind of say that the students weren't bothered by the noise of people playing video, so it didn't make it too noisy in the lab because obviously noise levels, if there are like. 50 people all playing videos at different volumes all on different bits it could become very noisy in the lab um, which could be an issue for some students um, but that wasn't something that the students said was an issue so um, yeah so there's certainly scope to continue to develop that as we come back in again. Wonderful Sarah well thank you very much for an excellent presentation it's it's always really I mean I do I keep saying it but it's always really good to see when the the theory is put into practice and shows that it works. So thank you very much. I'm very appreciative.